So the last, I think it was on Monday, we had very briefly introduced the concept of a adiabatic reactor, but then on the example we did on Wednesday, we kind of showed exactly what we're talking about. So I just want to briefly go over that again to talk about uh, heating values, and then we'll move on to something that I think is, I don't know, one of my favorite sort of demonstrations to give in the class, and hopefully we'll get through all of it. Uh, so the example that we started on, on Monday was the combustion, so the, basically the adiabatic flame temperature. And for this, we were playing around with uh, methane. So CH4 plus 2 oxygen going to CO2 plus hydrogen. Now, in the adiabatic flame temperature, keyword here is adiabatic, so Q is equal to zero. So effectively, what we're trying to calculate in an adiabatic flame temperature is if we take all of the energy stored in the chemical bonds of our fuel and convert it to CO2 and water, how hot does the system get? Right? We're not allowing any energy to escape. So the only way that CO2 and water can handle the energy that is released when the bonds are broken is by increasing their temperature. Right? And the molecular representation of temperature is the average kinetic energy. Right? But there's also a lot more involved there. The heat capacity just more or less tells us all the different ways that a molecule can store energy to control its velocity. So for this, and, and, and we won't go through the whole example again, uh, but <clears throat> the flame temperature so in pure oxygen, and I believe I actually assumed constant heat capacities in this example because I want to be able to do it in class. So not necessarily going to be the most accurate, but it's hot, right? Very hot. Now if we did it in air, which is basically what we would want to do anyway, just because air is free, Something that's pretty reasonable. I mean, 2000 C is really hot, but I would argue fire is really hot as well. So <clears throat> one of the reasons why we care about temperature kind of pulls us away a little bit from what we've been em emphasizing uh, with energy balances. Now, in energy balances, temperature is not a conserved quantity, right? Because if I have a gas at a certain temperature, let's say like hydrogen or oxygen, or maybe even more simple than that, uh, a noble gas like argon. And I compare that to a gas of, let's say, a liquid hydrocarbon fuel, they have different amounts of energy in the system, right? They're translating at the same amount, right? But one molecule certainly is storing a lot more energy than the other one does. So when I put them together, right, <clears throat> each are contributing a different amount of energy. But one area where temperature is important is in a kinetic process, which is tr heat transfer. Right, how the energy transfers from one state to another. So the reason why all of our energy balances all talk about enthalpy. Enthalpy is a conserved quantity. Enthalpy is a representation of energy for a lot of our open systems at constant pressure. But the reason why at some point we will have to start about care about temperature is where we talk about heat transfer. So heat flux is governed by Fourier's law. So Q dot, which would be joules per meter squared per second, right? This is the rate of heat transfer based on how much surface area is available. Right, we have the thermal conductivity and the gradient in the temperature. Right, so the gradient, so who's familiar with this, uh, this term? The upside down triangle. Okay, so most everyone. Uh, basically, this is just saying, this is a general way to write this equation where we don't have to define are we working in Cartesian coordinates, spherical coordinates, cylindrical coordinates. But basically, the, the gradient says take the derivative with respect to the spatial dimension for all of the spatial dimensions that we worry about. So in the case of a 1D system, this would be dt dx. 
for example. In a 2D system, you'd have dx dy. 3D system, you'd have dx dy dz. Right, so the rate of heat transfer of a system is proportional to the temperature difference. Right, the steeper the difference, the more heat is transferred. So when we're talking about a heat exchanger, this is a shell and tube heat exchanger. Man, you guys talked about heat exchangers in 1703, probably? A little bit. So if we're transferring energy, let's say I'm going to call this T hot of side A. This will be T cold of side A, T cold of side B, and T hot of side B. So this is A, this is fluid B. Typically, this is how we'd want to design a heat exchanger. So in this case here, uh, A is the hot side, and B is the cold side. <coughs> So the energy in this process is going to be going like so. Now the reason why we would design a heat exchanger like this as opposed to the other way around, <laughs> if we put the hot fluid on the outside, it would be radiating some of its energy to the surroundings, whereas if we put the hot fluid on the inside, the only place it can lose energy is to the fluid that we want to heat up. So. If we were to look at the temperature, having an axis here at the center line, in order to have heat transfer occur, we look at the temperature as a function here of, let's say, this parameter x. Here's our wall. We want to find a way to get energy to go from the hot side to the cold side. So if I need, for example, if let's say T cold of A has to be equal to 1,000 degrees Celsius. Oops, sorry, sorry, no, 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 that's not okay. T B hot, my bad. T B hot. That's the fluid we're trying to heat up. Right, so if I want my fluid B to be at 1,000 degrees Celsius, let's say that's the best conditions to perform a particular reaction. Or maybe that's where I need to boil this really viscous fluid, or sorry, really dense fluid. That means that my T hot A has to be greater than 1,000 degrees C. So although energy conservation is what we use to solve all of these problems, there is still some significance in noting what the temperature needs to be. Now, the difference in temperature, the delta T from the hot to the cold side, in general has to be greater than some limit of practicality. For example, if I have a stream that's 1,001 degrees Celsius, in theory, I could use it to heat up another stream to 1,000. But that temperature difference is very, very, very small. Right? So my gradient would be very, very small. So it would take an extremely long time to actually transfer that energy. So in the case of if I actually needed to heat something up to 1,000 or over 1,000 degrees Celsius, I would basically have to be using a flame at an extremely high temperature to have a large temperature difference. The hotter the fluid needs to be, the larger the temperature gradient between the two need to be. And this is all going to be something you talk about much, much more in your heat transfer class. But I just wanted to touch on this here because we've always been talking about enthalpy, but I wanted to bring us back to reality for a little bit and talk about how we would actually accomplish these things. So the rate of heat transfer, right, the meter squared here, and the second these are all going to be very costly parameters. If you need a huge surface area, that means you have to buy a really big heat exchanger with lots of pipes with really expensive conducting materials, like copper, for example. 
Copper is very expensive. Seconds, meaning you've got to have a lot of fluid in the system for a very long time. So this is just like question six on the project. Right? You have to figure out how big does your reactor have to be to physically hold all the volume of the gas for its residence time to conduct the reaction. So the faster you can have a reaction occur, the smaller your reactor can be. The faster you can transfer heat, the smaller your heat exchangers have to be. And these are the give and take exchanges that you have to consider when you're designing an overall process. And going into those nitty gritty details, that's the focus of the junior year curriculum. Right? How do we actually achieve the calculations that we've predicted in this class? How do we design the reactor based on the kinetics, based on the type of catalyst, to get us to the conversion that we need inside of a reactor that is a feasible size? Right? So one trick you can always do is amp up the pressure, because if you have a higher pressure, you can cram more molecules into a given unit of volume. Right? So these are all the give and take exchanges, but sometimes maybe the pressure is going to work against the equilibrium mechanisms. But I just wanted to take a moment and uh, just ground ourselves a little bit in sort of what the future will hold. And uh, remember that temperature does matter, but for an energy balance, it doesn't. Right? Enthalpy is the only thing that matters. Okay, so uh, one other topic. I just want to make sure that we get uh, one more of those heads is uh, heating values. So when you buy a hydrocarbon fuel, the reason why we just burn hydrocarbons is because they are extremely complex mixtures of molecules that really don't have a lot of other purpose. Some compounds in hydrocarbon fuels, like, uh, like crude oil, there's enough of it you can extract it, right? So some light, light compounds like you know, propane, ethane, methane, maybe even benzene, naphthalene. So some of these simple, small molecule compounds, you can distill the crude oil enough to extract some large-scale commodity chemicals. But for the most part, a lot of the other gunk that's high molecular weight is really complex. And it's so complex that we can't necessarily use it for a synthesis or for a real commercial application. So the best thing that we want to do is just burn it. So we don't know what all the compounds are in the fuels that we burn. We just know they burn pretty well and they give off a lot of energy. And so when you're purchasing a coal or a petroleum, you'll want to look at what its heating value is. And that tells you how much energy would be released per kilogram, for example. So this concept is captured in two concepts, higher and lower heating value. So heating values. So the idea behind heating values is that sometimes you only want to buy something just to burn it. So the higher heating value higher heating value, or H, H, V, this is equal to the negative delta H of combustion. And this means you are producing liquid water, and generally it's going to be in kilojoules per <coughs> mole of your fuel. But of course, if we were buying coal, for example, we would be looking at kilojoules per kilogram, or BTUs per pound, or BTUs per ton, that's the units that you would be looking at. Right? So in order to know how much CO2 and water you'd be creating, you'd have to have an elemental composition analysis. What's the mole fraction of each of the different compounds? But we wouldn't know what the bonding is. We would just know the total amount of carbon, and the total amount of hydrogen, total amount of oxygen, total amount of sulfur. How they determine that is they burn it and they measure the gas composition. The lower heating value, LHV, is equal to the, uh, so basically this is with, uh, this is with uh, gas water as a product. And again, this would be in kilojoules per <coughs> mole. And so the relationship between these two is that the higher heating value is equal to the lower heating value plus at 25 degrees C. That's the only difference. So it's just the same concept as forming something in the gas phase versus forming something in the liquid phase. 
But one of the main reasons why uh, I want to bring this up is because of the fact that a lot of the compounds that we deal with, we will not know the exact molecular formula. <coughs> and so any hydrocarbon fuel that is purchased commercially, the heating value is the most important number. And that's what will dominate the price of it. Right? So there's going to be a, a sort of a, a economic decision. Do I want to buy a smaller quantity of a fuel that has a higher heating value, or do I want to buy a larger quantity of a fuel that has a lower heating value? Right, so something that's really carbonaceous, those carbon-carbon <coughs> bonds don't have as much energy as the carbon-hydrogen bonds. So methane is one of the best you can get. Okay. Now, on to, on to one of my favorite parts of the class. It's an energy balance on a car. <laughs> so the question is, So when you're filling your car, how much energy are you actually putting into your gas tank? I think this is a really important concept to understand why liquid fuels and solid fuels are so important. Okay, so we're going to use our approach that we've done so far on balancing <coughs> uh, reacting systems to get an understanding of how much energy are we physically putting into our car when we fill it up with gasoline. So let's say we have a 15 gallon tank. which is 56.8 liters. <clears throat> and we fill that in five minutes, which is 300 seconds. We are going to approximate gasoline as octane. And the material properties, the delta H of combustion of octane is minus <coughs> So I'm going to write this as 5.47 times 10 to the 6 kilojoules per kilomole. Its density is equal to 0.703 kilograms per liter, and its molecular weight is 114.2 kilograms per kilomole. And we want to look at the power how much power are we physically putting into the system? Ultimately, I want to compare this to an electric car to show why it's so much easier to get a car that runs on gasoline that can crank out 300 miles as opposed to an electric car. OK, so basically what we have here is just a material balance problem, a stoichiometry problem, and an energy balance. So what we're going to do is we're going to approximate the heat of combustion as the amount of energy that we're putting into the vehicle. It's not 100% accurate, right? Because the heat of combustion is assuming that we have liquid water as a product and the tailpipe gases are all leaving at 25 degrees Celsius. In addition, we also have a little bit of inefficiencies in the engine, but we'll account for that in the next step. <clears throat> so, the number of moles of octane that we are filling into our car if we're filling it up completely from a bone dry tank all the way to the top, 15 gallons, the number of moles of octane would be equal to its volume times by its density divided by the molecular weight. And assuming I did everything correctly, 0 0.35 kilomoles of octane are being filled into the tank. So the energy that we are then putting in when we fill up our tank, assuming that we can combust it and get it all the way to 25 degrees C again, our energy into the system is the number of moles of octane times by the heat of combustion. I'm just going to do absolute values here so we don't have to worry about negative and positive signs. 
It is 1.91 times 10 to the 9 joules, which is equal to 1.91 gigajoules. It's a lot of energy. Yes? Um, have we taken into account the time it took? Like, this is an amount of flow rate, isn't it? It's just how this is the total number of moles. Okay. So that's what we're going to do right now. So the power. Right, the rate of energy that we're putting into the system is going to be our 1.91 times 10 to the 9 joules divided by 300 seconds. And we get out 6.4 times 10 to the 6 watts, which is equal to 6.4 megawatts. So I wrote this example when I was uh, rewiring my house. And so I, I related this to a standard plug. So I don't know if there's, you guys know what a plug looks like. I want to just point to a plug. Ah, see this plug right here, right? So these, the standard outlets that you have in your house, these are 15 watts, sorry, 15 amp outlets, right? So if we compare this to a plug in your house, it is 15 amps times by 120, oh my gosh, I can't write anything right now, 120 volts, right? Amps times a volt gives you a watt, right? This is 1.8 kilowatts, right? So one standard plug, a 15 amp plug, which is a 14 gauge wire, can give you 1.8 kilowatts. So we would need approximately 3,500 household plugs. Another thing is a house, an entire house is typically wired with a breaker. I mean, my house is an older house, so this is probably a bit skewed. And I, I said 100 amps, but now they're typically up to uh, 200 amps. Or, so if you have a 200 amp house, this would be about 130 houses. And that's if every plug is being used and drawn from at the same time. Yes. Time, right? okay. So if I wanted to put as much energy into my car as I am by filling it up with a tank of gasoline, I would need the maximum, not the typical usage, but the maximum allowable usage for a standard home circuit breaker Right, your whole house, if you somehow pull 200 amps in your whole house, your, your, your household breaker will blow. No one uses 200 amps, right? That's only for like, maybe your refrigerator is starting at the same time, your air conditioner is starting the same time, your garage door is opening the same time, the microwave is running the same time, the jacuzzi is firing up, at the same time the washer dryer, same time your electric stove is on, then maybe you would pull 200 amps. Right? So 130 homes is how much energy you're getting. Yeah, question back there. Just out of curiosity, for what time of fuel did you use? I'm approximating gas as octane. So I could look up I could look up the heating value of gasoline to give us a more accurate estimate. For your density though, did you see like 85 octane? No, this so this is so uh, that octane that you like when you look at a gas uh, at the gas station, that's actually a standard test based on I think I don't actually know if it's the energy output or like how well it burns or something like that. I think it's more something about it's a, like anti-knocking necessarily than the energy density. I think the energy density between the different grades of octane are similar, but it's a different type of test that assesses that. But this here, I'm just assuming like the liquid and alkane hydrocarbon octane as a, as a stand-in for gasoline. But if we wanted to, we could look up the heating value for gas. Yes? So, I'm just kind of thinking about this. So like with electric cars, mm -hmm. No, so I have that one. Let me finish up this example here. I'll be, I might be a couple minutes over top, but I want to tie this in because if we start to take into account some efficiencies and differences of ranges, we can get a pretty good, actually similar uh, comparison to why an electric car takes as long as it does to charge up. Okay, so in this example here, this is the, the raw energy that we're putting in, but the reference, remember, the reference here is based on this heat of combustion number that we've used. This is assuming everything that we put into the system, we can burn completely, extract all the energy out of it. So this is including, right, these numbers here are including just the heat energy. 
Right? If we cooled all those exhaust gases back down to room temperature, somehow we're able to extract the energy out of it. That's how much total energy we're putting into the system. Right? That's, why, that's why chemically covalent bounded stuff is really good for a fuel, because it stores a ton of energy. Okay, but let's say, for example, we're only getting about 40% efficiency out of our engine, which is pretty typical. Right? And this is still also an overestimate, because this is assuming that it's still leaving at 25 degrees C. So we're probably getting maybe closer to 20 or 30% efficiency. All right, so our engine is only 40% efficient. <clears throat> so our electric vehicle, we're going to say has a 100 mile range. And we're going to say that our gas vehicle is getting 25 miles per gallon, which gives it a total range of 375 miles. Right, so if we want to compare apples to apples, we want to see like, how many miles can you get out of this vehicle to do a better comparison. So I'm going to say that the EV has approximately 25% of the range of gas, of the gas vehicle. And this is reasonable-ish. I mean, now we've got some electric vehicles on the market that are much better. Uh, so the total power then needed to get 100 miles out of the electric vehicle following these sort of assumptions here, uh, so sorry, sorry, total energy for the electric vehicle is then going to be equal to our 1.9 times 10 to the 9 joules times by our 40% efficiency times by our reduction in the range of the vehicle would give us uh, 191,000 kilojoules. So let's say, for example, I want to charge my vehicle overnight. So that my power requirement is going to be equal to 1.91 times 10 to the 8 joules divided by 8 hours times by 3,600 seconds per hour. That means my power requirement is much more modest, 6.6 .6 kilowatts, or approximately four plugs worth of energy. Now, I think I've overestimated uh, it a little bit because you can plug in a lot of electric vehicles. And, and most times when you get an electric vehicle, you don't actually have it plugged into a standard plug. As an extreme, like, last resort, let's say you're staying at a friend's house, for example. Well, some electric vehicles, you can plug into a standard household outlet, but it takes like 24 hours to fully charge it up. So most times you have to use either a 220 uh, voltage plug, which has a much higher current allowance, or you put in a special kind of like in-home supercharging station type thing. So it all makes sense if you look at it from an energy perspective, right? So. If you want to get an electric car that has the range of a gas car, you have to physically find a way to get that much energy into the system. So if you wanted a car, an electric vehicle, that overnight could have a 500 mile range, you would have to fundamentally alter the entire electrical infrastructure that we have in this country. Because you just couldn't have enough homes pulling that much electrical power. So the reason why, I mean, that's the reason why electric cars really haven't taken off as well as they have. I mean, they're, they're up and coming now, but they're just, you just can't compete with how much energy is stored in gas. So I don't mean this to trash electric vehicles, but I'm just meaning to say here is that that's why gasoline is so, so <coughs> useful, is because those covalently bonded interactions store so much energy, right? And it's this, hopefully this example demonstrates how much energy is stored in hydrocarbon fuels and, and crude oil or coal, all these different things. Uh, all right, so with that, uh, this is a question on, on the content? Okay. All right, have a good weekend. See you guys.